And now we have with us um, Oliver De Payer, who is, uh, who is part of the High Altitude Bioprospecting Project, uh, with also uh, Melissa Grant and Paul Shefford, uh, who happen not to be here tonight. Well, well this, 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 this team of scientists are currently developing um, um, an altitude bioprospecting project that he will explain us what is that uh, to search bacteria in the um, in the stratosphere so they they, they they've been uh, sending this rocket and these balloons in the Nevada desert and well he'll tell us more about this journey I know thank you very much um, first of all that's a, a book, not by Lewis, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, thanks to my computer crashing, I uh, very hardly cut these slides out about two hours ago from another excellent book by Melissa, Melissa Grant, you just heard about. So uh, thank you very much to Mel. That's why some of the slides you'll see will say uh, proof only on the back. And I'm sure she won't mind the fact I think she's listening in now. Uh, this isn't quite as uh, a good talk as Lewis's. I think it doesn't quite have the same... Um, uh, technical wizardry about it. In fact, what I'm going to tell you today is something a bit along the lines of a, uh, um, a uh, astrobiological desert field trip. In fact, it even um, it even ends up in black rock. So that's that's where they have Burning Man. So if you can imagine Burning Man for astrobiology, um, well, okay. So let's. I mean, at this point, I meant to say who I am and where I work for and what research I do, but um, in fact, I'm not here officially. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm here but I'm, I'm here, you know, uh, sort of versibly, because Lewis, I think, covers um, astrobiology very well, and, and he did a very good survey, and astrobiology is predominantly, at least in the UK, all about the, the astro side, right? And the biological side, there's not that many biologists doing astrobiology, because you literally get laughed at if you do this. I mean, uh, people laugh at my boss, and so I don't tell my boss I'm doing this, because they want people to laugh at him by proxy, and so I think what I've ended up as is a biopunk um, or, or, the, or a biohacker. And this is a book, I might get it on my Christmas list, maybe you want to do the same by, by somebody, I've read some reviews, said it was half decent. And what this describes is that molecular biology and the reagents and so on are getting cheaper and cheaper, and the knowledge about them is getting better and better, and they come in kit form. Um, and you can in fact literally do these things on your, on your kitchen table if you want to. I actually did it on a, on a baby changer because my, my daughter's grown out of nappies and so I, I put the baby changer next to my bed in my bedroom and I did it on that, which, which sounds a bit desperate, but if I said I was soldering an electronic circuit or putting a PC together, working, you know, doing a, you know, a, an oil painting or something, you wouldn't think that was so incredible. So maybe we're now moving into this area of DIY biology or biopunking and so on, where people will do molecular biology at home and you might think that, that is a, a terrible idea on safety grounds. And it might be, but I'm going to describe something a little bit, a little, perhaps a little bit more benign. I wasn't making GM crops in my bedroom. I have actually made GM crops in my day job, and that's, that's very easy to do as well. So that's biopunking. Now, how did anybody give me money to do a project not related to my day job, or indeed related to Paul's day job or Mel's day job? Is this working? You're still there. Okay. Not relating to our day job and basically going completely off the reservation and, and working on something really novel. Now, the only people I know who, who do this sort of thing are, well, back then anyway, was Nesta. And I, I, I couldn't find a nice Nesta logo. So here's one we actually did in, in Black Rock with some time photography. Um, and that was the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. Um, and back then, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration was a very big thing for them in the same way that other things were fashionable in the last decade, you know, like, I don't know, Tony Blair and things like that. And so Nesta had this, this competition when, you know, they, they told you how wonderful interdisciplinary research was. I mean, it didn't. Those of you who are academics know that this would, this would absolutely bomb in your REE. But if you, know, if you don't have to score research in REE, if you get down to its basis, if you do it for fun or for mischief, you know, can, you, can you come up with something really novel? And so I went along with this and I thought, well, maybe, because there was funding at the end of it, you see, you could compete for funding. And I wanted to, um, I want, uh, what I do in my main job is, is lab robots. I thought maybe I can get some money to make a new lab robot. Uh, so automate molecular biology, so this is all the high-end stuff. And uh, nobody was interested in that. And then Mel, 
who I got to know quite well, she once said to me, what would be your dream? What would be, you know, your heart's desire? And I said, well, I'd like to go back and do astrobiology because I've done it in the past. I have actually done an internship in NASA years ago and I never managed to get back in. And I said, I'd like to do that. And then she was really interested and other people were really interested. So Paul and Mel and I got together, we bid for funds. We got the funds, the people at Nesta were interested. If you don't actually have to prove that it's economically or in an applied manner a good idea, what do you come up with? And it's in fact equally important. So that's another angle to it. So with a really very small amount of money, um, you know, we set to work building something entirely in our spare time. And Right, where are we? Sorry, just lost my way there. Now, the one astrobiological target that I've come particularly interested in recently is to fly things on high altitude balloons, because that's very cheap to do. There's an emerging hobby scene of people who buy army surplus weather balloons and buy up some helium and so on, and it's quite easy to fly an experiment to a pay uh, uh, to uh, altitudes over 100,000 feet quite easily. And somebody set a record of 140,000 feet just a couple of weeks ago. And these are people doing things, you know, on a bench in their, in their spare time. Students, hobbyists, whoever, and they fly these incredibly, well, to me, very sophisticated, very exciting experiments that go extremely high up in the atmosphere. And, there's, and it's very easy to do, as long as you can let it go somewhere safely and track where it'll go and make sure it's not going to land on the M6 or something. The CAA in this country, the aviation authorities, they're perfectly happy to let you do this. And so I thought this was a, a cheap and cost-effective thing to look at doing, and my colleagues at NASA were thinking the same. And um, so I decided I wanted to try and build something to look for life in the high atmosphere. And my particular angle on that, let's just let me just for the sort of so Lewis can cast his eye over it. The reason I'm particularly interested in this sort of thing, and he, he mentioned the atmospheres of Venus earlier, is that in the high atmosphere, so you're sort of in the stratosphere up here, say 100,000 feet, somewhere along here, what you have here is temperature at the bottom, pressure up the side, I see the scales got missed off, but anyway, we're down here, this is the icky hole the biological bit. Here's Mount Everest, and then it gets really very cold, and you run out of ozone, it gets a bit warmer. And sort of round about here, that's about 85 kilometers, and this is about, oh, I can't remember, we're five. Somewhere around here, you have this sort of what I describe as sweet spot, where um, there's, well, there's, it's a bit like the atmosphere of Mars, the UV light is extremely intense, but it, uh, it's just warm enough, it sort of comes up just above or below freezing, so you can have liquid water, it's not in deep freeze, it's not super dry, and the boiling point of water, although the boiling point is very low because water boils much more easily at low pressure, the boiling point of water is sort of two or three degrees centigrade, so you can have liquid water, it can exist, and by and large, wherever you find liquid water, you find life. And so I, you know, didn't have to run this past a funding committee or whatever. I said, could you have life hanging on on little moist clumps of dirt and so on at this altitude? And how would you go around looking for it? Now, people have often sent up balloons or, or hitch a lift, a lift on a U-2 spy plane, this sort of thing, with a little experiment on the wing or something. And people, wherever they look, even way up here, they keep saying they find stuff. And um, the, what they say is, you know, we stuck a petri dish, literally stuck a petri dish out the window, we gathered some dust on it, we came back, we left it to grow, we saw something. And, and I cast my sort of molecular biology eye over what they grow, and I, I'm very sceptical about this. Because um, just everybody who always looks, they always see something. But everybody's gone up, their whole experiment has gone up through all the filthy biological bit here on the way up and the way down again. And there's always a chance that you could actually have got a lot of dirt on it on the ground as well. And uh, so my idea was to actually do the whole, everything in flight. So nobody ever touched it. That you'd take a sample, you'd process it, and you'd get a reading in flight. It would come back saying yes or no, is there something or isn't there? And um, the target I chose, this is, you, you saw it briefly on Lewis's uh, video, was something called 16S RNA, which we all have. It's an essential part of every cell of every organism on this planet, and I amplified that up. Now, if any of you are biochemists, you might know of this thing called the polymerase chain reaction, which allows you to very easily amplify small bits of DNA. So you get a massive signal, you've amplified it up. You can see, you can see if it's there very clearly, and um, the only problem with that is that that basically involves heating up something to very near boiling point. And uh, that's up here. Here's, here's temperature and here's pressure. And that sort of boiling point there at 100 degrees centigrade. And 
you know, you've got all the way up to the high atmosphere, try to keep everything very clean and try to don't make any demands of the bacteria, you just want to process whatever you find in flight. And then I'm, I need to basically put them in a, in a container, put the lid on and heat it up to boiling point with one atmosphere pressure and so on. And, and then I think it's not actually um, the relevant conditions anymore. Then I'm really testing things that, you know, process in a PCR at one atmosphere on the ground. And uh, also it's quite hard to do. You need to build a little sort of, you know, airtight reinforced steel container. And down here, where we live, at 37 degrees, the boiling point of uh, water is, is really very low. Much, 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 about 20, um, 20 millibars. I see this is tors, not millibars. That, that's another measure of pressure. But it's much, much lower. And all of a sudden, I can begin to say, I've, I've captured you, you little organism in the atmosphere, and I, I haven't had to zap you with quite so much temperature or quite so much uh, pressure. Will you give up your secrets? Um, there are new things, and I just ordered one. It came in the post called um, isothermal PCRs that don't require heating up. So again, this is biopunk, getting more and more advanced. You don't need a boiler or pressure chamber or anything. What you just need is a slightly different enzyme which somebody's happy to ship you in the post. And all of a sudden, I was doing experiments down here instead of all the way up here, and, and feeling increasingly clever of myself when I had the basis of what I wanted to do. However, I only had a few months to do it, and I only had my daughter's old baby changer to do it on. But it, I came up with something like this, which is, I think, a very desperate attempt by a non-engineer to mix stuff together. Um, so that was all the complicated bit. But basically, this is a not particularly airtight, not particularly incubated or miniaturized piece of kit to mix things together. And it actually mixes one, two, three, four things together. I, um, I'll tell you what exactly I mix together later if you, if you want to know. And I, I suck air in and I mix it all together and it goes into this white bit here and I mix it with the fluorescent dye and if the amplified gene is there, a little detector there would have detected it and radioed the signal back to Earth. And the, ra the radios I could buy off the shelf, they cost sort of a couple hundred pounds. And this bit down here, there would have been a, there would have been a water heater that would have incubated this bit. And these are, these are gel packs which I got from a camping shop. And the idea there is when we were sitting in the desert, I, I had to keep it relatively cool in the desert heat. And then when it was flying up through the coldest bits of the atmosphere, I had to stop it completely freezing. So these things thawed out on the desert floor and then refroze again in flight and just they sort of buffered the temperature and it, it didn't get too exciting. And then I turned on the water heater, which isn't in this shot. And yeah, that was the plan anyway. So now I had that, all I had then was to get on the plane, which was an interesting experience, but I didn't get strip searched or anything. Carrying this with me, which, yeah, that, that was an interesting experience. But anyway, nobody stopped me, just had a big luggage excess. And I found myself in a garage near San Jose, because coming from the other side of it, I'm doing that you know, in, my, in my bedroom, and other people are doing stuff in their bedroom. And being America, it's all, all much bigger and better. In fact, it was in somebody's garage. And so somewhere in near San Jose was basically this missile factory, this amateur missile factory. Um, you can see the rockets and the nose cones. That's ours. You'll see that coming in later. That's the nose cone. And you'll see that one as well. And, you know, you laugh until you see this. And this guy's got a, a, um, a license to mix explosive. He's got a waiver from the FAA to launch these things. And, all of a sudden, I'm in a serious conversation, which I'd wanted to be in all my life, and somebody's talking about launching my experiments. And this is on a rocket, this is the bonus. You know, somebody at NASA started saying, we've got these guys with a garage in San Jose, they're sort of semi-pro, they're all actually, you know, most of the, their day job is working airspace and they can't stop when they go home. So not only did I have the chance to launch on the balloon, but also on a rocket. We did need to go somewhere where you could, um, where effectively there were no planes or people to land on, and, and Black Rock is particularly popular. When it's not doing Burning Man, it's, it's, it's the, the dozens of different rocket groups that use it. So that was the garage in San Jose. And then we got out to Black Rock itself, which is, which is pretty desolate. There's, there was just Paul on, his, uh, Paul on his laptop in that direction and me taking the photo in the other direction and an RV, which, you know, which is a nice little touch, but it got pretty austere after a few days sharing the RV between ourselves. And this, it's not as big a desert as I think people think, because in fact, within sort of 10 miles in any direction, there, are, there is human habitation or rows or so on. But it's, it's big enough 
uh, to make a, you know, a fairly sterile place to launch from, because I don't want to contaminate my experiment on the ground, and also the FAA were happy for us to do these launches. And a big part of it is not so much having an open area to launch from, it's to make sure it lands in an open area the other side. So these people spend a great deal of time actually predicting where it's going to go after it's lifted off. So we got on from that. Oh, and I'm going to say it's a bit boring today, but it's absolutely spectacular at night. And the best, the best star fields I've ever seen, although, ironically, somebody interested in astrobiology, I kept falling asleep because I was so tired after the day. But anyway, that's just another shot of it sitting in the RV. This is somebody's bed. I think it's, uh, it's Joe's bed. She's here today with us. I'll introduce her in a minute. Um, so there's the experiment again, and that's the computer and the radio, and that's a, a big chunk of transistors to switch the power through. We're just getting it ready for launch. That's it on the balloon. I've got a video of the launch to show you as well, but just to show you, you know, the, 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 the simplicity of these things. That's a parachute core. That's a parachute to make sure it comes back, it doesn't land on somebody's head. That's the balloon itself. That's a couple of hundred dollars. The helium is a couple of hundred dollars. NASA that donated that. That's a, a, a radio tracker built by somebody else so we can make sure we get it back. And this is, one of these boxes was my experiment, the other box was the radio, the computer, because um, FAA said you couldn't have anything weighing more than six pounds, so ours was nine, so we just split it into two boxes and apparently that was legal. So that's us um, <laughs> launching our balloon. This is just a video seen from the side, because the guy had his camera on the side. But just goes to show you, it's a relatively un undramatic thing when it finally goes. So we're on the end of the desert and we predicted and guesstimated it would blow back onto the desert. If it had gone up in those mountains, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to give you this talk now. But it, it sails away really quite quickly, the way to climb a couple of thousand feet uh, per minute. And then we spend the rest of the time chasing it. And it's not until you try driving around at speed in this sort of environment that you know what four-wheel drives were invented for. Instead of actually just, you know, I don't know, going on your daily commute. So, we waved that off into the sky and chased after it. And, and we got it back. That was fine. We found it. We were beeping away. But in true sort of waiting for Godot fashion, the radio had kept coming in and out all through the flight. And we hadn't been actually able to tell it, give it the signal to go. So we were very disappointed with that. But after having you know, we tracked it down to a faulty antenna, we did at least know what had went wrong. We, we got it ready again. And then it was time for our rocket launch, which was, you know, this in many ways was perhaps the more scientifically interesting way to do it, because you could have let the balloon drift for some time, you, you could have really, you know, spent some time getting used to up there, but there was no point with the radio not working, so we brought it back down. And then we got it ready for the rocket flight. And this is a, just a, a nice little montage of everybody getting it ready. We're, we're getting into the rocket. That's Mel, that's Joe, uh, who's, uh, sorry, that's Rainbow, who's with us today. That's Joe. Joe and Rainbow were uh, six formers. We won a competition to come and help us, so we were really, we were really grateful to have them along. And that's me, and that's Paul. And so we, 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 we represent you know, a variety of different you know, postgraduate and, and school interests there, none of which really explicitly included astrobiology when the whole thing started out. But there we are, sizing up the experiment to go in the rocket cone. And here's a little diversion. This is Homo serine lactone. Uh, from Anna Dimitri, who's here today as well. And this was our way of, of um, bringing in a sort of a cultural exchange into it, so it wasn't just science, there was an artistic uh, theme underlying it. And this was, I always like to think of this as saying, uh, take us to your leader, to anything we found up there. It's all sealed up because NASA wouldn't let us actually let it out, even though it's, it's, a, it's a commonly found chemical that bacteria use to communicate with each other across species and so on. And so we were going to fly this um, as just sort of like, you know, a sealed message. Next time around, we might actually open the top of the tube, but we thought we'd just fly it as a sort of mute, pro uh, mute protest to silly safety laws, because there seemed to be so few of them around. Um, anyway, so that, that was, that's a little artistic uh, intervention there. And here we are sort of sliding the experiment womb-like into its uh, container into that missile tube we saw earlier, and you can see some of the, the syringes and so on that, that, that help uh, draw the sample through the, uh, the, the little white reaction chamber I showed you earlier. And then um, uh, these guys slid it on the rail, and these guys are called uh, rocket mavericks, and uh, the people with the balloon, they were called stratofox, and they're both these sort of semi-pro groups 
who have a real passion for these things and their rockets are getting bigger and bigger all the time and they have you know, the relevant safety clearance and so on. So there they are sliding it onto the, the rocket rail and that's our group photo. Um, I, you can't make them out quite so well but that's uh, a, a, a guy called Rob, I forget his surname, he was the technical wizard and also in that photo in the centre is Thomas Aikenson who's a sort of dot com millionaire and this, before he did that, a bit like me, he used to work at NASA and, and this is his great passion now. And he does this primarily as a, a, a sort of school's uh, experience. He always brings a lot of students along and uh, tries to teach them as much real science as he can. And uh, all good rockets have a giant red button to launch them. I had to leave that in. With a key and everything and two flashing lights. And to my great delight, um, I got to press the red button. So we launched it. I don't have the launch video for you, I'm afraid. That was on the, like I said, I had to cut all this out of Mel's stuff rather, rather promptly than not because I've lost my computer. But anyway, it, it, you know, it flew like a bat out of hell, went to um, about one and a half times the speed of sound, and we all had a, we all had a great, we all had a great time. And, um, and then all the Rocky Mavericks broke out in man hugs. Now, <laughs> I saw that footage from, from, it was either Joe or Rainbow, but we've looked and looked, we just can't find it, so it, it, it must have got deleted, but they, an intense man hug sort of over there. Um, now this is not a good portent. We track it down again using you know, the expertise of rocket mavericks and stratopox and what we find is the rocket tube smashed in half and a, a, a giant, well not that wide a crater but it went down very deep and sort of the front half of the rocket has buried itself in the ground because the parachute hadn't opened properly. And, um, you know, I was gritting my teeth, I still thought we might, you know, might be able to sort of hammer it out, flatten it out a bit when we got it out. But, you know, once we dug it out and got it back, I'm afraid that was all that was left. <laughs> so it was about 40 centimetres long and now it was perhaps a tenth of that. Um, you can handle this for yourself at the, at the follow-up exhibition which we're planning. Uh, maybe we'll try taking bits to see what's inside, but it was of course a, a complete write-off and um, I, I assumed it might get blown onto the side of a mountain or something, but I never assumed it would come back like this and the, the, the loss of it was actually a very, a very visceral emotional thing and I was really upset about it and I was really angry at the physics of perhaps its openings for not opening properly and so on. But. Although that effectively got me, got us out of the game with the science we were trying to do, because of course the parachute hadn't opened, so it hadn't had time to do all the interesting biochemistry and things that I described. Although that was out of the game, we, there was still one major highlight to come, and I, it's worth talking about this because you know I mentioned this DIY hacker bio, biopunk thing, and like I said, you've got this amazing garage full of rockets, and it's important to realise how big these things are getting. So this is the rocket that they launched a couple of days after. And there goes the second half. Tails off towards a bit towards the end, but that's not at all bad for first stab, I thought. And uh, so that is what the future holds for this. And so now I'm trying to bring the astrobiology for this more hobby length sort of um, dimension to I'm trying to bring the astrobiology from one end to meet the, these rocket and balloon guys from the other end. Uh, it, it is perhaps, um, I should have rather, I should of course say how that ended. Uh, this is the definition of schadenfreude. Uh, yeah, the parachute didn't open and uh, so did that. I wouldn't say I felt better after that. Maybe I felt smug. Anyway. So yeah, so that was the, 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 actually getting the parachutes to work is one of the very hardest uh, parts because you've got to try and get them to open, jettison and open while the rocket's going supersonic. So that was the end of that, but if they can get the parachutes working or if I can make a much easier to make, less sort of, you know, cobbled together steampunk experiment, I wouldn't necessarily mind it getting buried in the desert as long as I got the data out. So that's, that's the other way you could look at doing it. And now maybe I can give away my email address and so on with absolutely no, um, no uh, institutional uh, address or anything on it to distract you. We, we, walk, we walk past that restaurant on the, on, the, on the way back to the airport and I like every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. I insisted I had my photo taken with it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, we still have uh, a little bit of time, like for two, 
three questions before we go to, to a break. Anyone? I didn't because they, they had actually had actually sort of um, what's the word you know I, I've given this as a play to NASA a few times and said oh, this is my idea one of the ideas was to be able to reprogram stuff in flight and say well that particular ex bit of the experiment looking more interesting let's concentrate I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to do was upload it in flight and of course that was quite got more than I could choose so the radio didn't work and I didn't so the, the rocket flight was running on automatic but the parachute didn't open. So yeah, it was a, it was a, I was gonna say actually one of my great frustrations was with some spare kit and a bit more money and a few more days open in, in the desert and part of that was the, the flight wave from the FAA which had very tight, they could do it again, you know? So I mean half of the vet astrobiology I think is the field trips. You can do theoretical astrobiology and then you can do practical astrobiology when you go to the North Pole or up a volcano or to Yellowstone parks. And I've seen, you know, uh, papers with 12 data points in it, and somebody says, well, why are there only 12? And the woman said, well, I was 35 miles hike from the nearest ranger's caravan, which didn't have water, but at least had a generator, you know? So um, people aren't going to land on Titan for that long, and there aren't that many photos from that, that probe. So yeah, the balloon thing at a pinch you could do in the UK, and so that's in many ways the more interesting one. Uh, to do it over again, not to go out to do it in Black Rock, because it's very attractive to do it in Black Rock. But yeah, it is an angle that it's the inability to repeat things in the actual wet field chemistry that in many ways um, pulls it back of things. If you could increase the access to these things, you get more done. And the flip side of that is if you could do it on a balloon, maybe you could leave a remote field station halfway up a volcano and leave it to do its thing, which is what I was trying with the radio and everything, you see, and then you could leave it there and you, you wouldn't have to keep sending out these expensive manned expeditions. I don't know whether you, you all consider that more or less fun. I consider it fun because I like making things on my baby changer. Anybody else? Oh, one in the middle there. So to build that machine, yeah. how much previous like, rocket building expertise, or you said robot building, I've never built a robot until that, no. Oh, okay. No, um, you know, they gave me, you know, £10,000 or something, and a vast chunk of that went on Maplins, for people who know it. <laughs> you know, um, I, I run robots with arms and flashing lights and so on, and they never work very well, and I, I, I became obsessed by the need to simplify this and build robots to just do one thing very well, and do it very cheaply as well. Because the other, the, you know, you've got this divergence between people doing biopunk and people going the other way where it's getting so incredibly expensive. It's eating up a vast chunk of your research grants and it's so hard to just get the equipment and the actual research that the council or whatever gets concentrated into smaller and smaller labs and the discipline gets tighter and tighter and the chances of you doing anything out of whimsy or interest gets less and less. It gets, I don't like it anymore, it's like a sausage machine. Um, and then at least for the money you'd like the robots to work, but they don't very well. So that was the other angle that I really think you have to make a new approach to build them differently. Now, Paul's original involvement, he, he does, amongst other things, 3D printing of architectural models. And we were going to 3D print it. Because it, wouldn't have been, it would have been you know, a, bit, a bit more flash. It would have been you know, one constant, one continuous piece of printed polyethylene and so on, but we didn't have time for that. We were told we were flying on the rocket very late, and it got very rushed and very improvised. Um, and if we'd had, a, if the guys in the garage had been able to help us a bit more, we would have probably gone a lot further. But anyway, yeah. So it was a first attempt, but that's my angle. That I think, um, if you go in, I think a lot of you, if you go into a molecular biology lab, you would be disappointed at how much it's just white boxes and kits of tubes, and uh, there's very little. Um, yeah, the vast majority of people there don't know how any of it works. And there are some old school people. Well, they know what the results are, but they don't know how any of the chemicals are made or how the machine works, and I really want to find out. I think it's part, you can't really claim to be a scientist unless you do, in my, in my opinion. have a break now but before that just uh, uh, some announcements uh, one is 
if you want to go to the toilet, very important, you have to go out and then go downstairs. Uh, second is, well, Cosmica is a free event and we try our best to, to keep it that way, so, but we appreciate if you go to the bar and have a drink. Um, yeah, you can donate to the bar. And uh, we're going to have around, I guess, around from 15 to 20 minutes of break. Uh, and afterwards we're going to have a, a video which is like half an hour long, it's about UFOs. And in the meantime, what you could do is you can try to go to that little room with Sue from We Colonize the Moon, and there's an experiment going on there. And it has to be uh, one by one, right? It takes two, two at a time, and it takes around uh, two minutes. So, yeah, go there, and at the end of the night, we're going to see the result of those experiments. Okay, thank you.